and good evening to everyone. Welcome to our study session again. I want to join with Reverend Aline and extend greetings to Sister Laptis on her celebration and to Brian and Judith as well as they celebrate. It's good to celebrate and we can join as brothers and sisters and rejoice with those who rejoice and share in the celebration. For those of you who would have missed the first session, I'm going to just do a brief um, recap so that we will give information to those who are joining us for the first time in this series. And also for those who are here, it will refresh some of your thoughts. Then I'm going to proceed to give you a listing of some of the verses from the Old Testament, which are connected to the Passover so that you get the establishment of the tradition. And you see a number of times where it was repeated in the Old Testament and where the indication of the practice and the observance of the, the Passover was there. And also make you aware of the, of the fact that over time, there were some slight adjustments to how the, the dating of the Feast of the Passover or the Feast of the Unleavened Bread how that was viewed in the Jewish tradition. And as I indicated to you the last time, what happened is that there seemed to have been a merging of, of the Passover as well as the Feast of on, on Leavened Bread. And they would want you to be able to see how that would have changed from what the original establishment would have been as God would have established it in, in the Old Testament. So that when you look at some of the the information given in the in the Gospels, you will see that they reflect that sort of merging in tying the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread together. And that's why the Feast of Unleavened Bread was, was also referred to as the Feast of the Passover. But from the Old Testament, you would have seen that there was a specific indication given for the preparation of the Passover and then the observance of the Feast of unleavened bread. So in our last session, what we did was to examine what was the traditional accepted timeline, which we have all grown accustomed to hearing, being taught, and through our tradition that have been established, we observe the timeline that would have been given to us, that would have passed down to us based on the views of those individuals who would have established their understanding from what they would have read in the Bible. I indicated to you that it was a misunderstanding and that's perhaps why that the tradition was based on the timeline that we were given. So we examine that timeline and then we look at some of the issues that were connected to that, that timeline. Now, what we're going to do tonight is to look at the timeline as identified by the references that we will look at in the New Testament, in the Synoptic Gospels, as well as the Gospel of, of John, to give us a clear understanding of what the word indicates. Now, it is very important when we come to the study of the word, this is one of the principles that we have established, is that we try to avoid coming with a particular mindset or a particular established position which we would perhaps be trying to defend because what happened is that we will miss essential truths that are there because we have already made it in our minds what we are looking for or hope to see. You just say sometimes if a person is editing and they have a, a particular spelling in their mind, even if they see an incorrect spelling, they might read it as if it is correct because they might coming and, and approaching the, the material with a particular um, mindset. For example, we have often seen the reference to Moses in Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. And you know, we have some sort of come along with the idea that it's just Moses that went up into the mountain. And so you could easily miss when you, when you actually read the text in, in a little more precision, that there was on one occasion where Aaron accompanied Moses because Moses went up into the mountain more than once. And there was an occasion where Joshua 
company in Moses at the mountain. And then there was a time where God said to Moses, oh, okay, you do not bring anyone with you. If you only think that it's Moses, because we've been constantly here, Moses went up to the mountain to receive the commandments. We could easily miss the, the fact that there were those other persons that accompanied Moses because we, we are reading from the perspective that that's that what we have come to accept. So in the same way, because the early interpreters had come to accept the Sabbath, the seventh day in, in the week, when they read that Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath, the conclusion was that that was the day before the seventh day Sabbath. Missing the fact that there were other Sabbaths, and when we come to examine our references in the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, we will see that there's a reference to another Sabbath in that week. So in actual fact, in, in, the, in that holy week that we have defined as the Passion Week, which represents you know, the final days of the life of Christ, we will see from the scripture that there were indeed two Sabbaths. Okay, but just to recap what we established from the tradition, the Holy Week would have started with Palm Sunday, and then we would have had Monday, Monday, Thursday, which would have been the time that Jesus would have had his last supper with his disciples. And then that would have followed by the Friday crucifixion. And then the Sunday morning resurrection. So that's basically the, the, the simple established timeline which tradition has followed, has been followed by the majority of, of, of the members of, of the church. I'm not just staying with the Church of God. This is church universal. That has been accepted by the majority. But of course, there are scholars who have studied the references, would have recognized that that is not precisely what the word is teaching. It is just a tradition that was established based on a misinterpretation. And that misinterpretation was that the Sabbath before which Jesus was crucified was the seventh day Sabbath. That's where we came to establish the fact that Jesus was crucified on a Friday. So what I'm, I'm going to be sharing with you is not just my own position or my own interpretation. We're going to look at the word and examine it carefully and see if it says something different to what the established tradition um, has come to be accepted and observed over the years. So we look back at Exodus chapter 12 last week to see the foundation or the establishment of the feast of the Passover. And we saw that from that reference, and we said that this was being established as a sort of parallel or, or prototype or, or shadow of what was going to come in the life of Jesus Christ. A reference had been made by John Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, referring to Jesus. And Paul also referring to Jesus as our Passover, who was sacrificed for us. So they accepted the fact that what was given in the Old Testament as, as, the, as the feast established by God was a shadow of what was supposed to come in the life of Christ. He is our Passover. And we will also recognize that in, in, the, in the text, in the Gospels, the emphasis is made on the Passover, not really just as a, as a day or a feast or event, but you will notice that the reference is made the Passover as the, the lamb itself. And so you talk about the selecting of the Passover and the killing of the Passover and the eating of the Passover. So really and truly, you don't, you don't eat a day or event or a feast. So it is directly referring to the lamb and that lamb would have been reference to what will happen in the, in the life of Christ. So we need to understand that a lot of the emphasis is placed more on the, on the sacrifice that was made. And we need to understand when that occurred and what's the significance of those two dates that were established. In Exodus chapter 12, it indicated that the lamb was going to be selected on the 10th day and kept 
until the fourteenth day. Then that lamb was to be sacrificed in the evening, and then it is going to be eaten on the fifteenth, which will obviously be the start of, of a new day from the night time. Because remember, we got to establish clearly in our minds when we are looking at the timeline in the Bible that we're dealing with the Jewish timeline and not the timeline that we are not operating in, which is according to the Gregorian calendar or the Roman system, where our night ends at midnight and we have a new day starting at one minute after 12. In the Jewish tradition, you began in the evening time and then you go to the daytime. So it means that six o'clock Tuesday, you are being, being ushered in to Wednesday, but we'll switch the start in the, the night time, and then we'll continue in the daytime and end at six o'clock in the following day. So we need to understand then that the feast of Passover actually started to be observed, and the lamb was actually eaten from in the night time of the 15th, which will be the following day after the 14th. That scripture reference also indicated that the day after the 14th, which is the day that the lamb was going to be slain, was going to be observed as a Sabbath. So that the Feast of Unleavened Bread will be observed from the first day, which will be the 15th, and then it ends also in the Sabbath. Seven days of Unleavened Bread were to be observed. So that was the tradition that was established, and that was established by God. That was not the tradition established by the Jews. That was established by God because, as I indicated, this was just a shadow of what was supposed to happen in the life of Christ. Because from the foundation of the world, so this is not just a, a tradition that was established for the Jews. That's why it's referred to the Lord's Passover. This was established from the foundation of the world that Christ would die for, our, for the sins of the world. And we saw that that was prophesied in, in Daniel when we were examining um, Daniel's prophecy. And so we need to, uh, to, to recognize that this is something that God established from the very beginning. The Jews were, were actually liberated from Egypt around 1445, 1450 BC. So we're talking about a long time that that tradition was established even before Jesus was even born. And so the Jews were observing that um, festival for a number of years, but, but things would have changed along the way. So I'm, what I'm going to do is to give you some of those scripture references. I'm not going to go through them. There is only about two that I would pay careful attention to so that you would observe um, what changes would have, would have happened over time. So what I want you to do is just to take these, these references down and you can look back at them as see how the tradition was established and how consistent it was. So we would have looked at Exodus 12 and we would have read from verse two to 11. So pay, pay note to Leviticus 23, five to seven. Make a note of that. Numbers nine, four to 12. Joshua 5.10, 2 Kings 23, 21-23, 2 Chronicles 30, 1-5, Ezra 6, 19-21, and Ezekiel 45, 21-24. Those are some Old Testament references that you can see Throughout the time period there, the Passover still being observed and they're still following the tradition that was established by God from way back in the Exodus time. Let us look at Numbers chapter 9. I'm going to read from verse 4. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day 
of the first month, Rashi tradition there established way back, in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man that they could not keep the Passover on that day. So if you were defiled, you cannot observe the Passover. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, we are defiled by the dead body of, of a man, whereof we are kept back, that we may not offer an offering of the Lord in the appointed season among the children of Israel. And Moses said unto them, stand still, I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, you shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. The fourteenth day of the second month, at even, they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. All right, so there was a special grant given to people who would have been unclean or who would have been traveling um, over a, a, a time that they would have missed the Passover. As what was established, they were given another opportunity to observe the Passover. Notice. What is significant is that according to the ordinance, you were not to break the bone of the, of the lamb. So the lamb was supposed to be eaten, roasted and eaten, but you were not to break the bone of the, of the lamb. And we saw that in another reference already. And then David also in his prophecy indicated that not one bone of, of Jesus would, would be broken. So that is part of, of, of the shadow that was to be fulfilled in reality in the life of Christ. Because we indicated that even though um, the others on the cross had their bones broken, Jesus' bones were not broken because he, he was actually dead before they were brought to do that. The reason for the breaking of the bones is that if, if you're on the cross too long, and remember a Sabbath was coming and they needed to get the, the, the people off the cross and into the, the tomb before the Sabbath came. So if they were taking too long to pass away, they would break their feet so that they, they would not be able to put any pressure on the feet. And then the, the, the weight of the body will cause more pressure on the lungs and it will cause them to suffocate. Because if you could put the, the weight on your feet, then you'll be able to keep your body up and then you would perhaps stay longer before you die. So that's why they would break the feet. But Jesus had already died when they were about to do that. So the, the other persons on the cross, their feet were broken, but not Jesus' own because he was already dead. And, and that was a fulfillment of prophecy which was made in relation to the parallel that the lamb was to be eaten by his feet, but not to be broken. Again, I want to look at another passage here in 2 Kings chapter 23, 21 to 23. Second Kings twenty three. It says here, and the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not held such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel, nor the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Joseph, wherein this Passover was held to the Lord in Jerusalem. So that is an indication that there was a certain period of time that the Passover was missed. And as a result of that, you, you got some changes in, the, in tradition then over time. Because in, in Ezekiel, it also indicated that there were some adjustments that were made. And that's why it was indicating to you that, that over time, the tradition changed from the distinct periods that God had established. And you found that there was a merging 
of, of, the, of the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now we're going to look at a couple of references from the New Testament, because when we, we come to look at this precisely enough for the timeline, we will see that this is what happened. For example, look at Matthew chapter 14. Mark, sorry, Mark chapter 14, verse 12, said, on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where will thou that we go and prepare that thou mayst eat the Passover? This is a verse that creates some difficulty for, for, for persons looking at the timeline because they say, well, if you're dealing with the Feast of Unleavened Bread and you're talking about preparing for the Passover, it meant that Jesus could not have been crucified um, earlier because the Feast of Unleavened Bread was following after his crucifixion. So you need to pay careful attention that that is a merging of the two. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover. Now, we, we would have seen from. Pardon me? So, we would, we would have seen from the, the tradition established that the, the, day, the, feast, the feast of unleavened bread started on the 15th. So, the Passover was actually killed on the 14th. But you see, but this is because of the merging. You see it coming up here in the, in the writings of, of the, the Synoptic Gospels. Luke 22, 1 says, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, July, which is called the Passover. You see? Feast of Unleavened Bread, July, which is called the Passover. Then Luke 22, 7 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. The day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. The Passover was killed on the day before. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover that we may eat. Then Luke 22, 15 says, and he said unto them, if desire, have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So Jesus is here indicating that he will eat the Passover with his disciples. He had desired to eat the Passover with his disciples before he suffered. Now, there's a key word in there that we need to, to, to look at. Desired or phrase, I have desired to eat the Passover. He's not saying that that's actually what will happen. It, he's saying that, that that is what he wanted to have happen, that he would have been able to eat the Passover with them, which would have been really on the 15th when the Feast of Unleavened Bread would have started because the lamb is going to be sacrificed on the 14th. And since Jesus is the lamb that is going to be sacrificed, technically, According to the tradition established, according to the timeline, he would not have been able to eat the Passover as it would have been eaten starting on the 15th of the month, the first day of the Passover, because he would have been sacrificed on the 14th. So the key word here is, I have desired to eat. Okay? So we're going to look at those references in a little more detail when we come to explain the timeline. Now, we say that with the traditional timeline, one of the problems that we'll, we will seriously encounter is in reference to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, which I gave last week. That as Jonah was in the belly of the real three days and three nights, he, the son of man, will be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Remember, this is a shadow of what is to happen in the life of Christ that is established in, in, in this um, parallel here, which means that it has to be accurate, it has to be precise. Because when we are dealing with God and we're dealing with timelines as we established last week, it's very precise. And God told the, the children of Israel that they're going to be in, in Babylon for 70 years, and at the end of that period, they're going to come out. They're not going to be coming out in the 71st year or in the 69th year. They're going to spend 70 years, as God indicated, and then they will be delivered. When God gave a specific timeline, we, we have to take that specific timeline as serious. 40 days and 40 nights means 40 days and 40 nights. God says he's coming down on the third day um, to the people at Mount Sinai. He's going to come down on the third day and not the second or the fourth day. So if Jesus says that he's going to be the belly of the earth, three days and three nights, three days and three nights means 72 hours precisely, three days and three nights. 
people wanted to use a partial day representing a whole day in order to be able to get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. Because remember the tradition established that Jesus would be crucified on the Friday and then he would have been, he would have been risen on, he would have risen on the, on, on the Sunday morning. Now you cannot get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. That's one of the problems which they face. As I indicated last week, and for those who were not present, one of the ways in which the Jews try to make it very clear and precise that you're dealing with a full 24 hour period is that when they were given a nominal value in relation to a time period, like day and night, that is an indication you are dealing with a 24 hour period. So 40 days and 40 nights would be precisely 40 days and 40 nights. So three days and three nights would be exactly three days and three nights, which would be 72 hours. I remember Jesus said in, in, in John chapter 11, are there 12 days, 12 hours in a day? Now, Jesus is saying that to make it clear that you're dealing with a daylight period of 12 hours, which means the night time is 12 hours, and that's a 24 hour period. So obviously, if Jesus indicated that a day has 12 hours, he says he's going to be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. He's going to be dealing with 24 hour periods, 12 day, 12 night, and that is exactly 72 hours. Now, you will also notice when we look at the, the, the New Testament um, writings in relation to the, the women going to the tomb at the resurrection, you will notice that it says they went there early the Sunday morning. The texts do not say that Jesus rose Sunday morning. And we will look at those precisely. Remember I said when we're looking at scripture, we have to look at it in relation to what is being said rather than what we think it should say. Because we have a mindset based on a tradition that might have been established in our minds. So when you look at those scriptures, you will realize that they're talking about when the women went to the tomb. Another issue that would arise from the timeline that is indicated by tradition, where they said that Jesus would have arrived in Bethany the Saturday, and then the scripture went on to, to mention on the following day, people laid um, families in, in the, the street and they celebrated Jesus' um, journey to Jerusalem, which we will call the triumphant entry. So that's how they arrived at the Sunday, because we look at John chapter 12, and we're going to make reference to that tonight as we look at the timeline from the Bible. I'm just trying to establish what we, we looked at last week and some of the verses that we were connected, connecting to try to understand how the, the early interpreters arrived at their conclusion. So John chapter 12 is a very um, key chapter because it indicates that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany and he had supper with Mary, Martha and Lazarus. And then it went on to say in the following verse that the day after on his way to Jerusalem is when the people laid the palms in the street and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that's referred to as the triumphant entry. Now, if Jesus entered Jerusalem on the Saturday, sorry, Bethany the Saturday, it means that he would have been traveling virtually the most of that day coming from Jericho. Um, and what some um, Bible scholars and theologians argue is that Jesus would have been violating an important Sabbath day tradition in that you were not allowed to travel long distances on the Sabbath day. You had what you call a Sabbath day's journey, which was a very short journey of necessity. They would allow you to travel a very short distance on the Sabbath. But Jesus would have been coming from Jericho, as we indicated last week, where he would have healed um, Glenn Bartimaeus. And he would have had a number of people also following him coming down to Jerusalem for the Passover. And it is not likely that all of those Jews would have been breaking the commandment along with Jesus, because Jericho is roughly about 15 or so miles from Bethany, and they would have been traveling 
more than the distance that should have been traveled on Sabbath day's journey. So that's why there is the indication that Jesus would have been traveling on the Friday and not on the Saturday. We will come to see how we arrive at that time when we are looking at the, the biblical um, perspective. So that's one of, of the other things that would be opposed to, to the Friday um, crucifixion. The three days and the three nights, Jesus come traveling, having to travel a long distance on this on this on the Sabbath, which he would um, not be inclined to do, seeing that it would be, be breaking a law that was established. And remember, yes, yeah, Jesus broke laws that were established in the, in the Sabbath tradition, but out of necessity, indicating the reason why he did it. But he didn't have to travel from Jericho to Jerusalem on a Sabbath. There's another day that he could have chosen to travel. So that was not out of a necessity. So that's one of the arguments that will be used against the, um, the Saturday arrival in Bethany and then going to Jerusalem on the Sunday. Another argument is also most theologians recognize the fact that the entry into Jerusalem represented the selecting of the lamb to parallel with the tradition that we saw in Exodus chapter 12, where the lamb was selected on the 10th of the month. So coming into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, they believe that that represented the, the selecting of the lamb, Christ, coming in to make his announcement and declaration and to be examined because the lambs have been brought from, Jeru from Beth Bethlehem into Jerusalem on the 10th so that they could be observed and examined and the selection made on, on that particular day. So many of the Bible commentators see that day as representative of, of Jesus being selected as the lamb who is going to be crucified then on the 14th day. So if Sunday was the 10th day, it would mean then that Monday would be the 11th day, Tuesday would be 12th day, Wednesday will be the 13th day, and Thursday will be the 14th day. This is why, as, Re as Reverend Jefferson pointed out, some people then will go for a Thursday crucifixion because it is said that the lamb is supposed to be kept until the 14th day and then crucified. That is if you go with the assumption that it's Palm Sunday that Jesus enters Jerusalem. So that will eliminate the Friday because then if you go to Friday, you're going to extra day when Jesus will be crucified. So that is not on the 14th day at all. So we have three major objections. The day he was born into Jerusalem, the length of time from the Friday to the Sunday, and then following the tradition and its precision, where the lamb is selected on the 10th day and slain on the 14th day, that would not match their timeline if they're saying that Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday which is the Sunday that we refer to as the triumphant entry. All right, so what we're going to do now um, is to look at the, the timeline that has been given according to what we see references being made in, in the New Testament. And I'm going to give you two different positions, but we're going to only focus on one tonight. That is the one that has been identified by R.A. Tory, whom I would have mentioned last week, and Brother Weeks would have made reference to as one of the persons who would have done some intensive studies and have established the fact that Jesus would have been crucified on the Wednesday and not on the Friday. And he started his timeline from the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And as I, as I indicated, we had a merger of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the Passover. And that's where you're going to have a difference in, in how some scholars will see the timeline, depending on where you're going to start from. Whether you're going to start on the 15th or you're going to start on the 14th. Because we have just seen from the New Testament that sometimes the reference is made to the 14th as the Feast of unleavened bread and the Passover. And sometimes you see the 15th being mentioned as the feast of unleavened bread as well as the Passover. What has what happened really is that the Jews started to look at the, at the whole week as just the feast of unleavened bread. 
And that's where you would have sometimes emerging, and it seems like an indication that they were tying the two of them together. So what I'm going to do is show you Ari Tories timeline starting from the 15th, because he is seeing the 15th in terms of some of the reference made as being referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of the Passover. And where he's starting from that point is because he's also looking at a, a chronology that was worked out by astronomers. I remember I showed you last week um, that those people who were, who were for, the, for the Friday as the day Jesus was crucified looked at an astronomical timeline which indicated that Friday was the 14th of, of, of Nisan according to their timeline, which was in the period that Jesus would have to be, have been crucified, which was between 26 and 36 um, AD because that was the time when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Syria. And we know for sure that that's the time in which Jesus was crucified because he actually had to appear before Pontius Pilate. So they examined the time the timeline in there and saw that there were two Fridays on the 14th of Nissan, and that gave some credence to what some people were arguing for the timeline. But as I indicated to you, I would rather go with the biblical timelines than, than, than what astronomy comes up with because there are also different positions that other people have drawn from the same astronomical calculations. And there was one done by NASA. They were looking at full moons and they were going back in time to see when full moons occurred. Now, reason for that is the, the Jewish month starts on a new moon, which means that by the middle of the month, and you know, the, the Jews were working a lunar month, which would be a 30 day cycle and it was based on the moon simply because the moon takes about 30 days to orbit the earth. So a lunar month would have been exactly a 30 day month according to the Jewish um, time schedules. We have no months 31 days, 28 days and 30 days. But in the Jewish system, the months are basically a 30 day period based on the, the lunar movement. So if the month began, as many of, of, of the Jewish month began on the new moon, it meant by the middle of the month, which with the 15th of the month, you're going to get a full moon. So NASA in their research, going back astronomically to, to new moon periods, recognized that on, on that particular time, in, in that Passover, in that year where Jesus would believe to have been crucified, that the new moon, the full moon, sorry, the full moon was on the 15th. And it was a Passover. They indicated that it was at a Passover that the full moon was the 15th. So, so Tori starts from the 15th as his beginning point to look at now John chapter 12, which we're going to make reference to again, because all the, the timelines are going to point back to John chapter 12, because that's the specific timeline that we've been given um, that we can have as a reference point. So all the positions, who those who believe in Thursday, those who believe in Friday, those um, who believe in Wednesday, all reference back to that period indicated by John. So we're going to pick up that. So, so Tori is saying he's starting from the 15th, which is referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Feast of Passover, as has been indicated from some of the New Testament texts that we just read. So if that's the 15th, then he is saying six days before the Passover to take us back to the 9th. simple mathematics. So it means then that if John is saying that Jesus came into Bethany six days before the feast of the Passover or before the Passover, Tori is saying that that indicate that he came into Bethany six days before the 15th, which will bring you to the ninth. So Jesus then will be having supper with Martha and Mary and Lazarus on the ninth of Nisan. And then it says, and the following day, he went into Jerusalem where he was welcomed. And that was the triumphant entry. So his triumphant entry then would be on the Saturday and not the Sunday because 
his arrival time for Jesus in Bethany is the ninth and not the tenth, as the original traditional view had it, and then work out Palm Sunday as that particular Sunday. So then if Palm Saturday then, it was a Saturday, now we see how the timeline works. Saturday then would have been the 10th. So that's when the lamb would have been selected. So it means that Sunday will be the 11th. Monday will be the 12th. Tuesday will be 13th. And Wednesday will be the 14th. That parallels with what we would have established in Exodus chapter 12 and all the other passages that you were seeing. The lamb is selected on the on the fourth on the tenth day, kept until the fourteenth, killed in the evening, and you started to eat from the fifteenth, which is immediately after the event. That's why very often you you get them tying them together because some people would have actually started to eat the lamb from on the fourteenth because you're transitioning from one evening into the other, moving from the fourteenth to the fifteenth. You are moving from an evening on to what begins the night of the 15th, the Thursday. Follow that timeline again. Six days before the Passover, meaning Passover being looked at as the 15th, and, and in the next session, I will look at it now, and the other person looking at it from the 14th, because those are the two alternating um, positions you're going to get based on how they are looking at the New Testament writings. Sometimes the 14th, sometimes the 15th, there's a tie between Passover on eleven bread and there's a merging. So we work the timelines from both positions. And what I would indicate that both of those positions will bring you back to the rings day. So going with our story, Jesus comes in on the ninth, has supper. Obviously, he would return from that long journey from Jericho. And he didn't go straight to Jerusalem. He stopped in Bethany. Bethany is roughly about two point five miles away um, from Jerusalem, two to three miles. So when you see the text further down in John chapter 12, which I showed you last week, which says that the following day, he went into Jerusalem. It meant then that that following day in Ari Tori's um, timeline would have been a Saturday. And he said it fits perfectly then into the lamb being kept to the 14th day, which will bring you to Wednesday, killed in the evening, and at three o'clock was the precise time that Jesus would have died. And, and again, you will you see from scripture, we often make reference from 12 to 3, and that's what our tradition in Good Friday used to observe. We used to keep service, if you remember correctly, from 12 to 3, basically on every Good Friday. Over time, that tradition changed. So you see that we can we can change traditions. Some people still maintain that 12 to 3 tradition, but I, a lot of our churches, we, we have not stuck um, to that from that 12 to 3 um, observance, you know, um, to row. But it's still observed in basis. But when you look again at the, the precise indication in the Gospels, you will see that Jesus was crucified at nine, the sixth hour of the, the third hour of the day at nine. So he was on the cross from, for all of that time. It's from 12 to three that the Bible says there was darkness on the earth. We will see in, in, in Matthew, the earth was covered in darkness and there was a great earthquake. And Jesus gave up the ghost at exactly three o'clock. When he died, that's at the time of the evening oblation when they started to kill the lambs. So you only have a period between three o'clock to six o'clock to get your lamb killed because that had to be done before the 15 starts because we saw from the indication that the 15 is a Sabbath. So the, the, the correct interpretation here is that when the word said that Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath, it meant the day before the Passover Sabbath. So we're going to look at some precise details to show you the references that the, the, the synoptic gospels, as well as John, refer to the 14th as the preparation for the Passover. And they also indicated it was the day before the Sabbath. I will also show you 
I will pause in maybe about the next five minutes, but I will also show you that there is specific indication in the, the, the New Testament text that there were two Sabbaths in that week. And this is not a conjured up idea now, um, this is not just to try to establish um, a position for my particular viewpoint or those who hold the view that Jesus was crucified on, on the Wednesday, that was the day before the Passover Sabbath, we will actually show you from the Bible that it had to have been two Sabbaths being mentioned and not one. And we will see how that would have complicated the issue if we assume that Jesus was crucified the Friday and then the ladies went and bought spices and ointments to complete the embalming, the question was when would they have done that if the following day, the Saturday, is the Sabbath, stores are closed, and then as you move on from the Sabbath, you're going to go into Sunday night. The women are not going to have any time to buy and prepare those spices if you're only dealing with one Sabbath. And we will see from the scriptural references that we have two Sabbaths. Now, how does the timeline now work to fit into the Wayne's day? Three days and three nights. So Jesus is crucified at three o'clock and he must be buried before the Sabbath starts, basically at one minute after six. I would say that in terms of our timeline, but the Jewish tradition was as soon as the three stars were seen in the sky, that is ushered in uh, another um, day. But we will say at sunset. When in now to the, the, the dawn, the dust period, you are into another day. So then it means that Jesus is taken down. He is partially um, prepared. Joseph of Arimathea is going to be giving him his tomb. And interestingly enough, you will see that Nicodemus gives some help. And he bought some, some aloe, lots of it, to, to assist in the environment. And this is the same Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night, who was afraid to reckon, be identified with Jesus, saying that the, the, the scribes and Pharisees were so hostile to Jesus. Nicodemus, who was afraid to be seen and coming by night, now has a transformed heart, transformed life. And he is bold now, not only to identify with Jesus, but to help in the embalming and give assistance to Joseph of Amartya, Amartya, so that everybody can know now he has a connection to Jesus and he's not afraid to admit to that. So we definitely see that a change has taken place in Nicodemus. And as we often say, if you have a genuine connection with Christ, something happens and something changed. And that's a true reflection. So Jesus now is placed in the tomb. So he is going to be in the tomb Thursday night. That's Asherina of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of the Passover, as it is referred to as well. Thursday night and Thursday, 12 hours in the night and 12 hours in the day. Then he's going to be also in the tomb Friday night, 12 hours, and Friday daytime, 12 hours, two days and two nights. Then he's also going to be in the tomb Saturday night time and Saturday daytime. That completes three days and three nights. Literally three days and three nights. 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. Give us 72 hours precisely. So it means then at the ending of the Sabbath, as you begin to dawn out or go into the dust period of the beginning of the Sunday, I remember a Sunday night. So if Jesus remains in the tomb and rises Sunday morning, as we would often have been indicating, he would have been in the tomb an extra night, which would have meant he would have been there three days and four nights. So what we are saying is that Jesus arose from the tomb precisely at the ending of the Sabbath. He went into the tomb as the Sabbath had ended, and he got out of the tomb as the Sabbath had ended, Lord of the Sabbath. Which means that precisely at 72 hours, as you begin now to go into the Sunday. Now, I, I have indicated before, I do not have an issue or a problem 
with us celebrating the resurrection on a Sunday. Because as I said, you are just in a threshold. Because when you when Jesus arose then at the end of the Sabbath, you are now beginning the Sunday night. So, so, so technically we could we could celebrate the resurrection on, on a Sunday without without any um reservation as is that we are way offline. No. But it's just that Jesus will not have remained in the tomb the night because he would have had to spend then 12 hours of the night to then have arisen the Sunday morning as it began to dawn. What the scriptures say is that the women went to the tomb early the Sunday morning. It did not say that Jesus rose the Sunday morning. So to complete the timeline that, that God would have established that has to be precise, my, my um, position would be to accept the fact that Jesus would have entered Jerusalem on the Saturday, kept until the 14th day, which would be the Wednesday, crucified the evening time of the Wednesday, right, which meant that he would have had the supper with the disciples Wednesday evening. Remember, evening comes before day. So Jesus would have observed the supper. That's why he referred to as the supper because he could not have observed the Passover because there was no lamb. Notice that the references in the Bible say that he had supper which was bread and wine. He had, and it did not say it was unleavened bread. He had bread. It could have been unleavened bread. But he took bread and he broke it and he ate it and he drank wine. There was no lamb because Jesus is the lamb. And the lamb could not have been killed yet because you are in the night time. The lamb is going to be killed at three o'clock on the following day when Jesus is going to be crucified. So that's why Jesus said, I desire to eat the Passover with you. He did not say, I'm going to eat the Passover. So when they asked, where are we going that you to prepare the Passover for you? They were of the understanding that Jesus was going to be around for the feast of the unleavened bread or the feast of the Passover. And they're asking, where are we going to go? To make this preparation for you, not knowing that Jesus did not give them any revelation because he did not want to at that time cause any anxiety or, 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 or any issues in relation to the time that he was going to die. I also want you to pay attention to the fact that Jesus, and we look at that when we look at the Gospel of Mark to give specific details, that Jesus will go into Jerusalem, he will teach the people, but he will move back to Bethany every evening. Because you will recognize that the scribes and the Pharisees were trying to take Jesus and to crucify him before the time that God had designed. And nothing is going to happen outside of the timeline that God has established. Don't care how much people try to change it. Jesus was not to die before the appointed time, as the word has indicated. So he never stayed in Jerusalem. He knew the plan of what they were trying to do. He would move out and go to Bethany. And the scribes of the said, even among themselves, we want to take him. But we cannot do it before the feast day because they would be, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we cannot wait to, to, to until the feast because they would be not roar. They can't do it during the celebration of the feast of the Passover. They have to do it before. And they do not even realize that they'd be fitting into the pattern that was already established because Jesus is going to die before the actual feast. Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th. He is going to die the 14th. So keep this clear in your mind. Wednesday night comes before Wednesday. So going on from Tuesday, that's why some people say that they don't have any record of what happened in the life of Christ on Tuesday. But really and truly, the, the, the Passover meal that he would have had, or what we call the Lord's Supper, because it was not technically pass all meal because we would be missing the lamb that, that would have been slain because Jesus is going to be that lamb. But he had the last supper with his disciples as a representation of, of, that, of that moment. And that would have taken place on the Wednesday evening going into the night. So that when Jesus finished the meal and he washed his disciples' feet, they moved from there as the scriptures would indicate, which I believe you have read many times before, he went into the, the, the garden where he spent time praying with his disciples. He was arrested in the night, taken to trial 
early the morning and during the daytime, he was moving from judgment hall to judgment hall. That's the Wednesday daytime. And by nine o'clock, he was on the cross. 12 o'clock to three o'clock, there was darkness all over the earth. And for those people who want to question the Bible and the authenticity of it, and whether it's about fables and it's about legends, there's actually a historian by the name of Thallus, T-H-A-L-L-U-S. He wrote in 52 AD. So he, he, he wrote even be, before the, the Gospels were written. And he made mention of the darkness that took place in Judea at the same time that corresponded with the crucifixion of Christ, he said that there was a gross darkness that came over the earth and that there was an earthquake that shook lots of places in Judea. And that's a historical fact written by a man who was not a Christian, but he's a historian. And he gave account of this time period, which the gospels later would have recorded, which means that that was information that was out there and that was publicized of darkness that covered the earth and an earthquake that actually took place, which then the New Testament writers recorded. So I'm, I'm throwing that in there for you to show you that it's really necessary sometimes to get extra biblical information and data and records because it helps substantiate the truth in the Bible. Now, as I indicated, I'm going to pause there. If you have any questions concerning that timeline, if you have any um interjections you want to make any things that be puzzling to you I'm, I'm going to give you that detail and then i'm going to I'll give you the opportunity sorry to, to do that then i'm going to show you how there were two sabbaths and then i'm going to pick up um some specific indications in the timeline to show you how it fits in precisely with what um Ari, Ari Tori's position is so I'm, I'm, I'm pausing at this moment. So I hope I've, I've opened up your thoughts. And if, if I get too much of a delay, I'm going to go on so that we, we maximize our time. But to give you a little preview here, because I would have said a lot, connected a whole lot of dots for you, and show you a different timeline, which we believe is one that can be supported in this, in this scripture which I will show you. But I want you at this time, if you have any questions or any comments, you can make them at this point in time. All right, see, you know, questions is yet, or right, let's look at the two Sabbaths. Uh, Rev. Yes, clear, clear sorry. For you. Okay. Um, so, based on what you were discussing um, earlier, I had yes. kind of three questions I was just was trying to um, pick up on. Um, you said that um, during the triumphant entry, uh, Jesus would yes. have traveled from Bethany into Jerusalem. Would that have happened? That would have happened, basically, we were saying on the Sabbath? Yes, that would have happened on the Sabbath. But, we, but, we, but remember, we said that the Jews allow for a short journey. That's where you have the concept of a Sabbath day's journey. Okay, that much I got. Right. Yes, right. So, then, so they, they allow for a short journey, but they, they, according to the, the custom, you're not expected to travel long distances on the Sabbath. You also mentioned that. Um, that entry would have been in alignment with the timing where um, the families would go to select and inspect their lambs, correct? Yes. So would that have also been happening on the Sabbath? That would also, that would also be happening on the Sabbath because you see it's part, it's part of a tradition as established. So they're selecting of the lamb. They are just selecting the lamb. They are not really uh, not really working. Right. Because it says there should be no servile work, right? There should be no servile work. So there are certain things that I guess be allowed according 
to, to, to traditions that would have been established. And since that was what God had established, I think that would, that would be accepted even in their, their Sabbath tradition. Because there are certain things that they would also still do on a Sabbath tradition. There were things that were forbidden, but there were, there were minimal things that they were allowed. And Jesus even demonstrated that if there's a necessity, when he asked them, if you're ox fell into a well, are you not going to go and take it out on the Sabbath? Which uh, means that you have to allow right for, 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 for necessity on the Sabbath. So since this was established by God, and he said that the lamb was going to be selected on the 14th day of the month, and the next day is, is going to be the, the, um, the Passover, it, it, it's, it, it's an indication that even though that would have been a Saturday, and, and then the Jews would have also been at any place to do that because they would be going to, to, the, to the temple on the Sabbath. And I believe at that time, the, the lambs would have been made available for them to see that. Fair enough. And mm -hmm. finally, and more, more controversially, are we then acknowledging the Sabbath as the Saturday? If you are acknowledging the Sabbath on the Saturday, mm -hmm. well, we are working according again to our, our timeline that we are, we are with fitting. But remember, as I indicated before, mm -hmm. in the Jewish system, they didn't have names of days. Correct. Right. Right. They had the first day, second day, third day, fourth day. But it's just that our seventh day coincides with our Saturday. So mm -hmm. that's why we will say the Sabbath on the Saturday. But it was not specifically identified in, in the biblical um, model as Saturday because they did not use um, that. They used day one, day two, first day, second day, third day, etc. Exactly. All right, just want to make sure that was clear. Thank you. Yes, right. So the Sabbath day will just coincide with our timeline. Now, right, so the indication is that there were two Sabbaths. And the mistake was made because people believe, again, they entered the text with the understanding or, or, or with the preconceived notion that when you see the day before the Sabbath and the preparation day, you mean in a Friday, because Friday is when people prepare. But that term preparation was not really the common term used for the Friday. That term preparation was used for the preparation of the Passover, which was more directly connected to that same time period. So you were preparing the lamb on the 14th to be eaten on the 15th because you're not doing any work. You're not, you're not killing the lamb then and preparing it because the 15th is a Sabbath. So Mark chapter 16, verse one says, as when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices and it, it had, had bought spices here. You will notice that had is in italics which means that that's a word that, that, that did not occur in the original. And I should mention here that in the King James Version, when you see italicized words, it's an indication or an admittance that those words or phrases will not have been in, in the original Greek or the Hebrew. That is their insertion in order to try to add what they consider as some clarification or, or according to maybe how they saw the, the particular text could be, be interpreted. And since they perhaps some of those translators might have been of the view that the, you're talking about the, the Friday crucifixion here, they say had, which is mean that they would have gotten this before. But if you read it, like some of the other translations have it, they would have said that Mary, the mother of James, Mary Magdalene, and the mother of James and Salome bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. When the Sabbath was passed, what Sabbath? It could not have been the Friday Sabbath because that would have been Saturday, as I said, and no stores are going to be open on Saturday. People are not selling any spices or herbs on the Saturday. And then when that Sabbath was passed, you are going into the Sunday night now where they are not going to be going into the preparation of those things to get to the tomb early Sunday morning. So when the Sabbath was passed here, referring to the 15th, which is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when that Sabbath was passed, which means that you were now into Friday, is when those ladies went and bought the spices. Luke 23, 56, I want you to make a note of these that you can read them back. And they returned and prepared the spices and ointments and rested on the Sabbath day. 
Now, again, if you're talking with the staff of day coming from the Friday, that could not apply because they can't return and um, um, get the spices and prepare them and rest them on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. That, that, that phrase there, according to the commandment, means the es that is the established Sabbath day, Sabbath now, which is the Saturday. So Luke is saying in agreement with Mark that the women return after they have seen where Jesus was laid. They return and they prepare the spices after that Sabbath, which as I said will be Friday, and they rested on the Sabbath day now, which means that they're resting now on the Sabbath that is coming. So you had the Thursday Sabbath, which they could not do anywhere on or buy any spices. They went the Friday now, which should be an open day, and got those things, prepared them, and rested on the Sabbath, which means they rested now on the Saturday getting ready to go to the tomb early the Sunday morning. John 19, 31 says, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, that's the term used for the day before the feast, that's the 14th, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that day was a high day. And I said, John is the only one to mention that. Remember, I told you last week, that pay careful attention to the fact that John gives details very often to give more light or give more completion to the narrative given in the Synoptic Gospels, which we say are Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they, they, they have so much in, in common in terms of, of their writings and events and, and even specific details that they give. But John, where he sees that there is important information missing because he was the last of the writers of the gospel, he indicates some information, and that was one. And the high day is the term we said is used for an annual Sabbath, the Sabbath connected to the feast, to indicate that we're not dealing here with a regular Sabbath. This is the Sabbath that comes on the first day of the unleavened bread, which is the 15th of Nisan. So Pilate besought that the legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So those verses there indicate for that so we are dealing with two Sabbaths. Now, let's go to Mark and pick up the timeline from Mark's gospel. We have an indication from John and we pick up from Mark because Mark gives some more information. And then we're going to look at two specific passages that are related to the timeline. So Mark chapter 11, and we're going to pick up from verse 8, because verse 8 starts from the triumphant entry. So, so Mark doesn't start where, where John starts, in that he looks at the supper which was prepared. Now there's another assignment I'm going to give you at the, at the end of the session, which I want you to check. I will tell you to, to look for where you see discrepancies in the accounts, or where you see variances, or what you see all apparent contradictions that people use to say the Bible um, cannot be reliable because we see discrepancies in the accounts given in the gospel, which is supposed to give specific details in relation to the life of Christ. And as I told you, we will examine those very carefully, the ones with, with relating to the crucifixion and the ones relating to the women going to the tomb. Because if you don't read carefully, they, it will appear as if these writers are contradicting themselves or are not given clear timelines. And one of these things that we have to examine is the passage related to the nine things we have for Jesus. So I'll give you those passages. I want you to check them carefully and tell me if you think the anointings are the same. Because this is where a, another argument comes in relation to discrepancy because we see different accounts. So let's pick up from Mark 8, Mark 11, 8. Many spread their garments in the way and others cut down branches off the trees and strew them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem, into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, now even tide was come, he went out 
to Bethany with the 12. So we're going from the timeline that this is Saturday and not Sunday. So the triumphal entry we established from the, the, the timeline from John is Saturday. So we are saying that this is the Saturday here, which Mark is picking up as the triumphal entry. So Jesus went in the temple and he looked around and he went out to Bethany with the 12. Watch it. And then on the morrow, when they were come into Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing the fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves and figs on it, etc. And and but not figs. And Jesus answered, said, No man eat fruit of thee thereafter for forever. And the disciples heard it. So Jesus cursed the fig tree then the following day. So that's now the Sunday he's going back into Jerusalem. Because if we said Mark is picking up on the Saturday, the triumphal entry. And it said then on the following day, he went, he went back down to Jerusalem and he cursed the fig tree because it says, and they came to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out those that sold and, 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 and bought in the temple. Well, true, no, he can do this on a Sunday. You see, he can, he can do that in, on a Sunday because you will say, well, Jesus can't be doing that work on a Sabbath and people in there selling things and, 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 and overthrowing temples and money changers and, and doing that. But this would be the, the day following the triumphal entry where he's going back into Jerusalem. So this is the Sunday now. And then we go on to verse 19. It says that when evening was come, he went out to the city and, on, and in the morning as they passed by, in the morning. So we're now down to Monday, which is the 11th. Saturday, the triumphal entry, he goes out to go back to Bethany. He comes in on the morning on his way to Jerusalem. He, he curses the fig tree. And then he, he moves back out in the evening, out of the city. And in the morning, he's coming back in again. So that's Monday. They saw the fig tree dried up by the ropes, etc., etc., etc. And then verse 27 goes on and tells, and they came to Jerusalem and he was walking in the temple. And there is Jesus now is going to begin to teach the people all through chapter 12 and 13. I remember this is where he talks about the destruction of the temple and the coming doom that is going to happen to children of Israel all through um, chapter 13. You will go through that still on the Monday and, and follow that right through. And it says at the ending, he says unto them, verse 13, chapter 13, verse 13, if I watch you therefore, for you know not when your master of the house cometh, even at midnight or cock crow or morning, let's come and suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, all watch. So all of this is what we were studying when we were looking at his, his speech in the temple and then on the Mount of Olives when he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and he gives some insight into his, his return. So we have um, Mark 13, we had Matthew 24, we had Luke 21. All of those were parallel with what Jesus was doing here. So this is when he was back into Jerusalem on the Monday he was teaching. And notice verse 14 moves on to say, after two days was the feast of the Passover on unleavened bread. You see how you see how they tie them together? After two days was the feast of Passover and unleavened bread. After two days was the feast of Passover on unleavened bread. So we are saying that that is what um, Tori would have picked up from the 15th. So if we are now at the 11th, and we're saying after two days, I remember the 11th is Monday. After two days, it means that two days have to pass, and then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is sometimes also referred to as the Passover. So it means then that you are dealing with Tuesday passing, Wednesday passing, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread would be the 15th. So you see how that fits into the timeline here. Enters in Jerusalem Saturday. He goes out and he comes in on Sunday, where he curses the fig tree. And he went into the temple and he threw the money changers and all of those things. And he went back out of Jerusalem. He returns in the following day where the disciples saw the fig tree dried up and they're wondering really, really what has really happened here. And just goes into the temple again and he's teaching the people and, and got a whole list of chapters there. And that brings you then, as it says here, after two days, you now, which will be following that, the, the account is saying after two days, we're going to have the Feast of Unleavened Bread 
on the parcel. So that's taking you to the 15th. So you can see how the timeline holds there. And that's where Toyota picked up from the 15th when he was looking at the parallel in John. Now, if you want to also see another parallel, look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Look at the ending of, of, of 25. Then he shall ask them, saying, Very the same unto you as much as you did on the least of these, my brethren, you have done it on, not unto me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, so that brings you down to, the, to the, the same part there where we saw in Mark, he was ending off his message in his teaching in Jerusalem, and that would have been on the 11th, which we saw. And, and then Matthew also mentioned the same thing. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things. That's the temple discourse, which he then proceeded to, and as I said, I carried on at Mount of Olive, uh, Mount of Olives, which we call the Olivet Discourse, which we would have all studied when we were looking at the timeline in the past, past session. It says that you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. You see what he says? Now, now Mark says, Feast of the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. Now, Matthew just said the Feast of the Passover. But again, that is basically using the, the same parallel connection. We say Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread. And he's saying after the same two days here, uh, since we were talking about the, 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 the Monday, means after two days means that Tuesday have to pass, Wednesday have to pass, and after two days, and that will bring you again to the, to the, to the Thursday. So, so those are the connections that we have to, to, to link the timeline. So I'm, I'm saying that the R8 to read timeline is a very plausible timeline, starting from the 15th, aligning it with what John said. And we look at Mark, which gave us a little more detailed account of the movement from the triumphant entry, showing us the days um, following and showing us how the timeline fits in. So I'm saying if you, if you study the word in that sort of detail, um, and there's a difference between studying the word and reading the word. Sometimes we read and we miss things because we're not given intent to specific details. And that's what we need to look at. Now you will also notice that Matthew chapter 26 has the feast of the feast of the italicized as well. And remember, we said that when we see things italicized, it's an indication from the King James because we don't see the italics in, in the other versions. That that is the translator's indication that they have added words or phrases that were not um, in the initial Hebrew or the Greek translation. See, and those are are things that we must be aware of. And, and then also, I, I want you to, to look at another little mark here. Look at Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 20. And we could pick up from verse um, 17. Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. I will break again and give you any opportunity to respond. Now, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Now you see, the, again, day and the feast of are also italicized. And this is a verse we say that people use to say, well, if the feast of our leaven bread is the 15th, and the disciples are asking Jesus about preparing the Passover, for, the, for that particular day, it means that Jesus would have been around. See, because again, they, they don't recognize the merging of, of, of the two events and how the tradition had it and the way sometimes it was expressed. And if you don't understand that, you can misread um, the indication that is given in the text. Jesus was not going to be around for the celebration of that feast because he's going to fit into the parallel and he's going to die on the 14th day. The feast starts the 15th day. But what happened is that the tradition 
start linking the feast of Passover and the feast of all November and speaking to them as if they were one in the same. And that's why sometimes you see them tied and merged. But when the, the, the tradition was established by God, it was specifically indicated that the 14th day was the day which the lamb was going to be slain. And the beginning of the 15th day is the first day of the feast of all November, which is the Sabbath. And they were precisely delineated in that particular way. But you can see from the indication here in the Gospels that you get emerging. I would dialogue a little more on, on, on those when we look at things that might be viewed as discrepancies and see how we, we, we sort of um, clarify those things. Now, what I want you to check for me is the indication of the anointing. Because you remember that when John spoke about the anointing, he said the anointing took place at Mary and Martha's house. And then you will realize that there are other passages that talk about the anointing and it mentions other names. So I want you to look at these passages and you study them carefully. I want you to tell me if they are the same anointings or if they are different anointings occurring at different times and what argument you can use for that. Because if we don't get that clarified, it's going to create some complications for us. So we got an anointing mentioned in Luke 17, 36 to 50. Write that down. This is your homework for you to study. Luke, 9, Luke 7, 36 to 50. You have John 12, 1 to 3. You have Matthew 26, 1 to 2. Luke 7, Luke 7, sorry, not 17, Luke 7. And then the final one is Mark 14, 3. We we'll go from three to ten. Three to ten. Right. So I want you to check those because we have to discuss those because they come into the timeline as well. Those anointing, and some people get a little confused with them and indicate that there's a discrepancy here in the account as to where Jesus was on a particular time because you will observe that there are similar, um, there's similar language used and, and similar details given. And some people argue that it's all one anointing just expressed in different ways. And we want to see if that is really true or in the scripture. But so you have two timelines there. No, next session, I will look at the timeline where the individual starts from the 14th now as the reference to the class over. So that when John says 12, six days before the Passover, that individual is going to start from the 14th and not from the 15th that I told you. Because they said because of that sort of merging, people will start from different points. But you will see that that individual still come back to avenge their crucifixion as well. Even starting from those two different points, you come back to avenge their crucifixion, which is very, very significant. Okay, so you have a lot to chew on. And you still have a minute or so if you want to ask a question. But but that's what I believe the scripture is teaching, that Jesus was crucified on the Wednesday. He was in the tomb three days and three nights. He rose at the ending of the Sabbath. When we went to the tomb early in the morning, and as we will see when we look at those scriptures, that they went there early and saw that the tomb was already empty. Significant to note. And those are some specific scriptures that we will look at. And then we will also be examining some of what looked at the part of discrepancies at the crucifixion and at the resurrection and see if we can get those reconciled. So we also had that to look at as well. So I hope you're doing that.
So that's it from me. But if you have any questions or statements, you can make them now before we close. I may hand over to Jeff. Good evening, Reverend Jackman. Yes, sir. Um, this is the Spooner. This is by the Spooner. Yes, it is. Yes, good I've to see missed. you. Good to hear you again. Good. Thank you. I've missed some of the uh, presentation, but what I've heard, I've heard you said that the, um, in the Jewish time, they did not have the days, the days were not named as we know them today. Right. My question is so, what, what method did they use to identify one day from the other? Well, just that we use to identify, we have names, they have numbers. So the, the number is, is, a, is, a, is an annotation as well. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So when they hit seven, they go back to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they go back. So it'd be just that their first day will correspond to our Sunday. So we, we technically can, can, can connect easier because we have um, the names given. But, but, but over time, you will know that the Jewish tradition still now end up connecting to the Gregorian calendar, which is worldwide. And they use Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday now. But at that time, it will be first, second, and third day. Now, oh, Reverend Jackman. Yes, ma'am. Um, Colleen Phillips here. So the, 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 the naming of the days coincided with what will happen in creation. You know, it says the evening and the morning with the first day. Yes, evening and the morning with the first day. That's where they establish the beginning of the day from the evening and going through then to the following day. That, that was their original timeline based on that. And that's how they observe the changing of their days. As I said, until the Julian and the Gregorian calendar introduce different timelines, and we now follow the Gregorian calendar, which starts the day after midnight. And that's that's work, the huge world away. Uh, obviously, in, in terms of having avoided confusion, everybody has to operate with that system. I mean, the Adventists still, still observe they start on the Sabbath from the Friday evening. But, but they can't go by the old traditional timeline and work their days and nights from the Jewish tradition because they were confused themselves and the whole world with their time schedules. So we got to work by what is the established position now. Just how we have to work, what is the established days? Sunday, the first day, Saturday, the seventh day. And then we go back to Sunday, the first day, and we, and we do the cycle all over just that they would do the cycle for the number. And, and, that, and, that's why, and that's why, sorry, their feast would have been consistent because it was established on the 14th day. Whatever day that occurred, the 14th, and whatever day the, um, the Passover Sabbath occurred, the 15th, that it, that it was. It was moving. It was changing. The, the, the fixation of, 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 of Easter in connection with the, the changing of the moon and the equinox is a tradition that was established in the in, in the Roman Catholic system, which again we will look at when we come to look at the whole um, Easter Easter thing. Yes, yeah, somebody was asking a question. Yes, please, Pastor. Yes, Brother Weeks. Yes, no, we, we we have times. I know you quoted Jesus quoting um Jonah three days and three nights. Yes. But Jesus also quoted many times saying three days. Yes. Right. Now, if you look at our one for sure, that does that that's one thing. I think four times was mentioned. The other thing, though, is in John. John mentions that it was preparation day for the Passover. Yes. Right. He mentioned it twice in the same text. That's correct. Right. So, so, so now, and, 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 and they crucified Jesus that same day. Yes. Right. So, John said preparation of the Passover. Right. So 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 that could also be interpreted that the that that the next day, meaning the Friday. Sorry, sorry, I'm talking nonsense. The next day, <laughs> meaning the Saturday, sorry, will be the will be the actual Passover. Yes. 
No, no, F are, no. You, you see, you see, you see that, that's what indicated that the Passover was related to that the lamb. So you prepare the lamb and then you eat in the lamb. So, so technically, that's why they, they're going to refer them as the Passover. One is preparation and one is the eating. Right, 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 right. Correct. Yes. I understand that. Right. Yes. Right. So, so the, the, the actual, so I'm saying now is that Christ was, Christ was crucified on the preparation day. On the preparation Passover. day. Right. Yes. So, all right. So, all right. Now, what we have been looking at so far is that the preparation day is not really the Friday. We're looking at right. preparation day. It's, it's, it's not really the Friday. Right. Yes. But, but what I'm going to say is then it can look as if John is, John is saying in chapter 19 that the preparation day is really the Friday. Right? It can, it can, it can, it, it can appear away from the text because it says here, matter of fact, let me read it for you. Or for us, rather, John says here. You're in what? You're in John 19. You're reading John 19. Yeah, I'll be finding it again. I think it's John 19. Um, John 19. Is John 19. Yeah. Um. Let me find myself. Let me confuse myself for a minute. John John 19. He, he mentioned in 14 and 31. Correct. And he mentioned in 42. Right. So John, right, right. He says, no, it's the, the preparation day of the Passover. Yes. And about the sixth hour, he said to the Jews, behold your king. And, right. they, and they cried, oh, away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Then let's say, but let's say to them, um, shall I crucify your king? But anyhow, the point is that he got crucified at the same time. Right? So yes. what I'm saying is that it could appear from this as if this is Friday. Now, the next thing too is that Christ mentioned a couple of times, and it's like scripture. scripture, Christ, Christ, Christ said many times that destroy this temple and in three days I can raise it up. He never mentioned right. three and a half. Well, all right. So if we count, if we, if we were to count from, from Friday to, 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 to Sunday, yeah. no, he died from, he died about three o'clock. That's taken right. Down, Taken down before the Sabbath could, 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 could come in, which is which is basically next day, six o'clock right. after. Correct. So if, you want, so, so if a man want to count then that, that 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 Friday is a day, then he has to count now from 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 six o'clock Friday to, to to six p.m. Saturday, if you want to call that a day. Yeah. And then and then from six o'clock Saturday evening, another day starts. Yeah. Now, if a man want to count those as 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 days, right? Because they, they have three hours left back in the Friday, a whole day from six to six is Saturday, and then you have a day starting out from Saturday evening going over. So Christ would have would have would have would have not been there when they got there early in the morning because he, he was um risen already. Yes. No, the person want to interpret that now as a as a how to put it, that those are three days and not necessarily uh -huh. literal may have a point. But what I'm saying is we have these three views because they have they, they have the we have a view for the Wednesday, you have a view for a Thursday, and you have a view for a Friday, which is interesting. And I think I think it may be a little challenge. We, we gotta really look at one. You use a scripture that's now there that's very interesting. I can't recall where it was. You use one with the men, the women buying some spices. Yeah. Now that's a no 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 that's a serious one to look at. That 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 one that one kind of knock up these views in a lit in, 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 in a sense. But I think I think though that this is something that we gotta really unpack. And and I guess I guess that's why we waited so long at the end that I don't well, want to interrupt you on anything that because there's a lot of stuff that I see happening here that can be interpreted a lot of different ways, but at the same time, we cannot, we cannot mistake the fact that the 14th of Nissan is a very important day. It can't make that one at all. Right. No. You can't, can't miss that. And, and those two sours are, are key. Mm -hmm. like those two sours are key. Yeah. Because they can't get those verses we can sell in one sour. No, you just said that some people for the Friday could argue about the three days. But right. you see, you're not dealing with three days. We, that's why I'm saying the precision here. Now you mentioned, yeah, there's other times where Jesus will only mention three days. Right. Or, 
but he, he, he gave the specific reference here, and, I, and I'm sure how those three days can, can be reconciled as well. The specific reference here, three days and three nights. You have to take that as serious because he said that that is how he's going to indicate that he is indeed the Messiah. He's going to die and, and, and after three days and three nights, he's going to return. But if you go with, with the, the Friday tradition, the only day and full day and night you have is Saturday. The only full day and night you actually have is the Saturday because the Friday you can't get a full day and night, nor the Sunday you can't get a full day and night. That's my mm -hmm. argument. So, so, so they can't go for three days. The statement is three days and three nights. And if you go from Wednesday, you get three days and three nights. You cannot get it from, you cannot get it from Friday. So, so, so that's my line of argument. You only got one full day and one full night on the Saturday. You only have a few hours on the Friday and you have maybe half of, of the time on the Sunday. You, you can't argue three days because Jesus says three days and three days and that's what we have to take literally. Uh, so Eddie? Yes, Jeff. Right, so someone is asking what about the Hebrew Jewish calendar that the Jews used back in the time of Caesar's rule? Just curious. When they say what about it, what do what they mean? Well, I'm, that, I'm not sure. Um, but, well, if, what, what they have to recognize is that, you see, when, when, when the Jews became overpowered by the, by the Romans, the Romans are going to introduce their systems of, of management and their systems of timelines. And gradually, the, the, the Jews are going to adjust to those traditions. So you had the Julian calendar before you had the Gregorian calendar. The Julian calendar was established by Julius Caesar. The Gregorian calendar was established by Pope Gregory, which comes down in the Roman Catholic system, but it's still Roman. So they would have adjusted to the timelines based on the management of those um, systems because they were now under Roman control. So they had to adjust um, to, to those, those timelines. That's why, that's why I, I showed you, and I, I will give you that again, that John, in John's account, John is using the Roman time system, while Matthew, Mark, and Luke are using the, the, the Jewish system um, of, of, of checking the timeline. And we won't go into that now, but I'll show you, because if you don't know that, you will think there's a discrepancy between the time that Jesus was crucified and the time that he was before the trial, because John's account will make you believe that J Jesus would have been getting tried while Matthew account was saying that he was already on the cross. And the question would be, how can you be getting tried and say the other account in other um, gospels are indicating that you are on the cross? That's because of the difference in the timeline used. Um, and John was using the Roman timeline and the and Matthew account was using the Jewish timeline. I will show you that in the, in the next um, section. So that is what will happen when you get different countries or different nations overtaking a, another um, nation. That's why some of the Jews' months contain um, Babylonian names because of the culture that would have impacted on the Jews. So, so you're going to get a merge of cultures, you're going to get adjustments of things. And sometimes you're going to see one time schedule used as distinct from another another time. Like that's because of the merging of cultures there. Uh, Reverend Chapman. Yes. Right. So um, these were some things I would have actually touched on with Reverend Aldine or uh, during the course of the week based on our last session. Uh, mm -hmm. You would have mentioned. Um, the confusion that Jews had with regard to the with the feast is supposed to start in the morning or the evening. And I would have suggested that it might be linked to the various translations um, of the Bible, whereas some persons mentioned the evening, others mentioned twilight. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that there are 
two toilets during a day. So that was one. Um, the other question I would have had would have been, if the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to be a lasting tradition, do other aspects of Exodus 12 still apply to uh, universally? And I would have made refer reference to verse 48 and 49. You are finished? I am. There was a question. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't get that. Go, 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 go over that. You said 40 and 49. Re refer um, to what? Um, if other aspects of Exodus 12, I mean, since um, the feast. Exodus 12, uh -huh. Exodus 12, 40 and 49. Since yeah. the feast of itself is supposed to be a, um, in the words that were used, a, Last in tradition, if right. other applications will still be applicable. If other applications will still, if um, other traditions, if, 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 right. if, yeah, but see, but what God institutes to be established is very often changed by man and his tradition and his customs. And we see that we see that in, in the Bible in, in many different ways. And that's why I try to show you how adjustments were even made, even though. The tradition was established. God gave way for the feast to be observed in the second month because of of, of um, some situation that would have occurred. And and if and I'm saying if God gave um, way for that, and I think even in Ezekiel it mentioned that there were there was a time where the priests were were not were were, were considered defiled, and they did what was recommended in Numbers. They observed the feast. In the, in the second month rather than the first month with, with, the, with the tradition. So, so there, there was indication from God that there could be a change. And then I'm saying the Jews themselves very often end up moving away from established things that were given as mandates for them to observe. So th that is what can happen. So even though God established something to be observed perpetually, man sometimes and his customs change that. And that's why Jesus told his scribes and the Pharisees that they give way to the tradition of men and, and, not, and not to God. And that was things that happened in the, in the Jewish tradition. So you, you can get changes based on things that have been introduced by man. And if you read, I think, Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, they were told that the Jews observe the feast of the Passover on the 15th. And some of the Jews question how we can have the feast of the Passover on the 15th when, when the, when the um, the Torah said that the 14th was the Passover, you see, because that was part of the change um, that came about. So traditions can change and adjustments are made then to accommodate the change. But when you go back to the original, you see what was instituted. That's why you want you to read those passages and see it was established, it was observed for a while. But then one pass indicate that there was a time when the Passover stopped. And when, when the Passover stopped, you see, those are times when you get things um, changing and interjecting when you reestablish something that was established. And that, that happened very often with some of the traditions of the Jews. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So then leading up to that, there would have been, does the Last Supper for the Christians supersede the Feast of the of Unleavened Bread? The Lord's, the, Lord, the Lord's Supper is, 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 is coincided with what Jesus did um, with his disciples before he departed from this world. Correct. Um, and, and we follow that tradition um, that Jesus would have, would, have, would have observed the Lord's Supper. But you mean why we do it um, on a different day than which Jesus would have done it? I or, mean, or he said that. Uh, is it our replacement for the feast of unleavened bread? I cannot say it's our replacement because we 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 really don't observe the Passover anymore. We don't right. kill lambs anymore. I, I remember that after the temple was destroyed in eighty seventy. You see, again, you got to watch changes. The, the whole tradition started to change with the the offering of the lamb and the sacrifice and and the, the slain of the lamb and the taking the lamb in the temple because you know you didn't have any temple so so even from that period you, you have adjustments starting to take, taking place now we 
ourselves as, as, as Gentiles, we, we never really observed the feast of the Passover because we didn't get in to slay any lamb because remember, a shadow wants fulfilled. You are not obligated to follow that in its entirety. So the shadow was Jesus was the lamb. He was offered as a sacrifice for us. So we don't have to kill a lamb or roast it and eat feast or eat unleavened um, bread anymore. But what some people do to maintain the tradition, rather than using bread with yeast, they use unleavened bread in celebrating the, um, the Lord's Supper. But the Lord's Supper really was really an observance of what Jesus did. Because remember, Jesus didn't kill any lamb, uh, had any roasted lamb. He, he ate bread and drank wine. That's what we do. So for some people, they could see it as, you know, a, a, an adjustment to what that feast would have been. But I, I think it's just paralleling what Jesus did. I remember on that same night, he washed the disciples' feet. Again, that was only recorded in John. Because John is not giving an important detail that the others might have missed. They indicated you is, is his rationale. And we observe the washing of feet. We, we used to do it before on Good Friday, but then we adjusted and we are doing it another day. Now, many people do it Monday, Thursday, because if you believe that Jesus was crucified on Friday, then that would be late nice to do it. But then again, that would be following a tradition. But Jesus would have washed his disciples' feet. Wednesday night before he was crucified. So you see, we're going to get adjustments to traditions based on how people perceive them, how people believe, and uh, what is significant that we observe, and what, what they parallel it with. Yes, Pastor. One more thing again. Yes. No, no. I know that we are big on dates and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I think I, I think that we have to be big on the event. Now, Passover for us is not going to be Passover for the Jews, right? So, so I'm saying we have a Sunday lockdown, and that was that because we're using the the, the Gregorian calendar. Yeah, and they want and, and instead of moving it from 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 having a different day every year. They have a Sunday that's fixed. So yeah. people have people have Passover different dates in the same month. People, so, you mean you mean in our culture is now? In our culture, I'm saying the, the, the one that we have coincides with the Jews. No. Right, that's what I'm saying. So so, so I'm no. saying, right, what when we celebrate Passover, the Jews, I don't think uh, we, we, we do it as yet. So the point I'm making is the point I'm making is if you're looking at dates as in a celebration, we can lose the essence because I don't think the date is the issue. I think the celebration of the event. So I'm saying I look at Passover or Resurrection Sunday as an event, and I celebrate that. Right. Now whether 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 that is where we celebrate it, which is the 17th or something. So this 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 month or something like that. I mean next month. Whether, whether we celebrate it that day that we normally do it or another day, I think that we should understand that we're celebrating um, resurrection and not necessarily focusing on a date. Because I think if you look at a date, um, there are persons, as I said, the Jews have the same, um, the same Nissan month and stuff, and they do their thing their own way. They celebrate it. We have a different date, but we still celebrate it. So we, we ask the question now, the Jews right and we wrong? Are now we right what, and they're what, wrong? You see, my, my focus, Brent, Brent, I agree with you. We celebrate an event. Right. But we mm -hmm. also we also have to celebrate truth because Agreed. the Bible is based on truth. Uh, I'm saying that people are questioning the integrity of the Bible based on truth and information that is supposed to be accurate. So what I'm trying to do is to show people the truth of the Bible versus a tradition. Right. Our tradition teaches us to celebrate events at a certain time, which is not, to me, the significant thing because you get issues with the time. That's why right. I said I have no problem with people celebrating the, 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 the crucifixion or the, the, um, the foot washing or the um, resurrection on, on, on their traditional or, or, or cultural position that I have come back set. What I am looking at 
is what is the truth as is given in the Bible as to when these things happen because truth matters. And if okay, we are okay. to right, right, and if we are and if we are to have the, 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 the same language, the language must be the language of truth. Mm -hmm. We accept that we have these traditions and we observe these customs because they said our, our traditions change. We used to keep Good Friday service from 12 to 3. I don't know how many people do that. We used to have foot washing on Good Friday. I don't think we do that anymore, but that used to be a tradition. It used to be a problem. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that we accept the resurrection of Christ. It is traditionally a Sunday because that's when we believe that Jesus will have risen. I don't have a problem with that because that's when the women went to tomb and the announcement was made. All I'm looking at is what is the truth of the word in relation to when Jesus was crucified and when he was erected. That is the language of the word. That is the truth. What we say to people now, we have established traditions based on these things. And we go with Easter because that was a tradition that was made for us. They, 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 it, it was a, a Roman Catholic priest that decided that he's going to fix Easter at a particular time. The, the first Sunday, the first full moon after an equinox is when Easter is. Mm -hmm. So our Good Friday is going to move with that to coincide with that. But what right. the word indicated is that that the crucifixion was a, a, was coinciding with, with the, the fast over on the 14th of a particular month, which was fixed. Tradition changed that because Good Friday now has to move because Easter moves. But the yes. feast of the Passover, the, 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 the feast of our eleven bread, and when Jesus died, would have been fixed, a fixed time. And that's all I'm doing, showing from the world what that thing was. So we understand that we are just following a tradition. And while well, I agree that events, because we celebrate Christ and we celebrate Christ all through the year. That's why he said we, I don't fix on, on Christmas the 20th of December because we should celebrate Christ all through the year. And that's what the important thing is. But just to know the truth, that we speak the same language and we understand from the word what the truth is. That's basically why we, we teach and why we learn that we have to learn the same language that we speak it. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Right. Uh, Reverend Jackman, yeah, um, now, you, you're all operating on borrowed time here. This is Jeff, this is Jeff time, so I yeah. would answer the questions. So, well, I, I, can, I can be short. I can be short. Very, very short. Um, at the, and, and in our tradition, we used to say that um, when Jesus observed the Last Supper, the bread, yes. the bread was symbolic. The bread was symbolic of the um, for the meat representing the, the lamb. But Jesus Himself has said, "This is a new covenant in my blood." Um, when He said this is a new covenant, was He separating that from the traditional? Passover supper? No, I don't I don't think he was making a separation there. He was as he, he was Jesus was not establishing a new covenant. The old one served its time and had its place. And Jesus is establishing a new covenant because he is really introducing the new covenant. I remember as I said when the temple was destroyed in 70, a lot of the old things that were of the former. Um, covenant were no were not no longer in place, and Jesus is the new covenant because there was the old covenant which God established with the Jews through the old Mosaic covenant. Jesus now is establishing that, and and that is the, the guaranteed through His death and His resurrection, which is His body and His blood that are given for us as the new covenant that God is now establishing, which opens up to the Gentile and the Jew. And make us all one in one body. That's the new covenant. So it's like that was setting the stamp or the seal on it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because the Jews, the Jews still observe the Passover. All right, Jeff, I think that should be it for the night. So thank All you all right. very much.